around uh, our design community. Um, so make yourselves a bit comfortable. We do have a couple of speakers tonight, from Janice Law and John Henry. Um, unfortunately, though, Dan McKeon, some of you probably have heard, some of you probably know uh, Dan, uh, his wife Rebecca. Unfortunately, Dan can't be here to talk tonight uh, due to some unforeseen sort of personal circumstances that he's facing. Um, so he does send his apologies, and we do apologise on his behalf. But we do have two, as I said, two great speakers tonight. Um, I'm not going to talk for too long, trust me. But first of all, I will introduce our first speaker. Her name is Janice Law. Uh, I first met young Janice Law about five years ago, maybe six years ago, uh, when she came to us at the brand agency uh, for work experience. And she was one of those work experience girls that you could give a job to quite easily. Uh, and I went out to a client and it was pretty well perfect. And that's pretty rare. So a couple of years later, we ended up hiring her. Um, and she is both literally and metaphorically my right-hand person. So I sit next to her every single day. Um, and I'm very proud to introduce you to Janice Law. Thanks, Dan. Thank you very much, Actor, for inviting me to speak tonight. Um, tonight I'm here to talk about my five years in design. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't supposed to say that. So yeah, tonight I'm here to talk about my five years in design. Um, I've been working in the design industry for five years so far, since I've graduated in 2009. Um, and what I've noticed is that um, inspiration for me comes from outside of projects that I'm usually working on. Um, to show this, I thought I'd keep on the theme of five and show you five projects that I'm um, working on, five things about me and five pieces inspiration for me. So to start from the beginning, um, five things about me. I'm a designer. Uh, so I didn't actually start off as a graphic designer. Um, when I was in high school, or even since when I was really young, I loved drawing all the time. Um, and TE art was my favourite project. And, and that was just what I wanted to do all day. So I got into Curtin and did creative advertising. I really liked looking at the solutions um, behind problems, and I think that's where my graphic design um, kind of knowledge stems from. Um, since graduating, um, I um, started working as a graphic designer, and that's where I saw my true passions. I was born and raised in Perth, so my parents are originally from Hong Kong, and um, in Originally, they intended to stay here for only two years, but we stayed here, um, and here I am, and this is where I call home. I have a dog called Shlomo. Um, it's, he's named after um, an Israeli violinist, but it, I just thought it was a cool name. Um, and I try to put a dog in almost every piece of work that I do. <laughs> I have a serious sweet tooth. So um, I probably have a piece of chocolate after every meal that I have, um, including breakfast. <laughs> and I really love hand lettering, um, but I can't write straight. So everything else on the page has actually been straightened in Photoshop or Illustrator. <laughs> Number five, I didn't, I left it as it was. Uh, so. During uni, going back to uni, um, I started a label called Little Miso. 
The name behind this was because JaniceLaw.com was already taken by an author, quite a well-established author, so I had to come up with another name, another label name. So I registered the domain and have stuck with it ever since. Um, I really liked drawing, so um, I created these loose, sketchy fashion illustrations in different inks and watercolours, and I put them up online. I got a bit of local traction with it, um, and I was asked to do my first exhibition, which was called Girls in Magazines, um, in 2007. And I created a bunch of um, 20 original illustrations that were framed um, and we had a launch night which was fantastic and I actually got really good feedback from that and sold a lot of works as well. These are some of the other illustration work that I've been doing. So a bit later in 2010, um, this piece was done on paper that I found at flea markets in Spain. Um, I continued, continued my drawing throughout um, uni and then on to my first job, which was at Magenta, a PR boutique, um, PR, uh, boutique design agency, um, which worked on lots of event and exhibitions for fashion and lifestyle clients, which I really enjoyed because of the fashion illustration side of it. Um, so these are some more recent illustrations and you can see the forms and shapes I've stopped drawing more people, but I'm getting into more um, abstract objects. So in 2009, I was still heavily into doing personal projects. And after hours, I had these ideas. Um, I remember lying awake at night um, and thinking, I would love to laser cut a teardrop out of wood and then put my writing onto it. Um, and that's what I did. So I found this online vendor called Pinoco. I'm sure some of you guys have heard of it. And um, well, it was really simple. I just had to send my Illustrator files off and then they got laser cut onto wood. So it turned out to be um, yeah, incredibly easy to do something I didn't expect. Um, and I never saw myself being a jewellery designer because I don't wear a lot of jewellery myself, but it's just something that I wanted to do. And um, yeah, I found it really, really rewarding. So this was my first collection, um, Courtiers, and it was a collection of about 30 necklaces and um, brooches and pins and magnets as well. Some more laser cut work. So I did this for about um, over the course of four years, um, which was designing and creating this jewellery, um, sending it off, um, making it, putting it together, packaging it, photographing it, selling it at markets, exhibitions, um, everything and it was so much work but very very rewarding and I learned a lot of techniques of like how to use your hands to make things and um, what laser cutting was so I learned, I learned a lot from that um, these are still pieces that I love I don't do it anymore um, but it was something that was kind of related to graphic design but you can see later how it inspires my work today So on to five projects. Um, from Magenta, I moved to the brand agency, which I've been to at, been at for the past three years. Um, and it's been, it was a big shift in work. So um, the clients were a lot bigger, um, but we had, an, I guess you could say, more corporate than the fashion clients that we had at Magenta. Um, but the scope of the work was a lot bigger and we were designing lots of environments and 3D work as well. One of my early projects um, was a development called Claremont on the Park and it's a current residential development around Claremont Oval and it's one of its first in Perth um, for something to be built around an oval. Um, the tone of voice of it is very urban and eclectic and um, street which adds a different dimension to what Claremont currently is. And the process of this wasn't linear at all. Um, we started off creating a logo, and then a couple of months later, um, Craig Buchanan, the creative director at Brand, and I came up with a photography, photography style, and he actually shot this all over the world, um, in LA, Hong Kong, New York, and around on site in Claremont, to get a very worldly and different feel. 
So this, I think, was shot in New York. And to go with this, um, I came up with this type style, which I guess is inspired by the brushwork and the illustrations that I do. Um, yeah, to say to, to say the language of Claremont. Um, so this kind of type style really became the voice of Claremont. And these are some hoarding panels which wrap around the oval. Um, and instead of putting just logos to wrap um, the development site, we wanted to give Claremont Oval a voice. Um, so yeah, so this this is a photo. It's not a very good photo, but I never thought that my handwriting, like my inks, starting from personal illustrations to today, would be wrapping an 800 meter perimeter of an oval. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Um, in uh, last year, I was asked to enter the Campaign Brief Supernova Awards. Um, and if for anyone who doesn't know, the Supernova Awards are open to anyone under the age of 25 in the advertising industry. <coughs> so you can be in a car service person, or a media buyer, or a designer, or a creator. Um, and the submissions asked for people to submit a 500 word document about themselves. So I wanted to demonstrate my skills as a designer um, and what was unique to me, so I hand wrote the entire submission. <laughs> which turned out to be a three metre scroll. Um, it, was it was incredibly stressful because I couldn't make any mistakes and I had to send them the original. Um, I actually did make one mistake around a third of the way through and had to start again. <laughs> but I made sure I did do it again. Um, but it was also really, really rewarding doing it by hand and writing every word that I had to say, brushing it out. Um, and I really felt like it was a personal piece for me as well. Um, it's also the largest piece of work I've ever created. Um, so it was, yeah, it was really good. And it got, went on to win a finalist, which was fantastic as well. Um, it went on, um, it got a really good reaction from the industry and went on to win um, a PADC bronze in the um, self-promotion uh, self category and um, got into the typism book last year. So as you can see, I'm starting to get into this like typography, hand ink thing. Um, and I found this program online which makes, which makes, turns your handwriting into fonts. So I thought I'd try it, um, and it was really, really rough <coughs> and imperfect, but I made these three weights, um, kind of for Claremont to use as well. Um, I opened it out um, onto Darfon as a free license for public and commercial, private and commercial use. And last year, I actually got an email from an agency in Finland um, asking if they could use my font to rebrand the city of Espo, which is the second market largest city in Finland after Helsinki, which is amazing. Um, they asked me if um, I, I was happy with, where they, with the accents, and of course I was. <laughs> so what it says is, um, let's work together. I had to just Google translated that. <laughs> Um, but they actually produced all this collateral, like there's t-shirts and pencils, videos, um, and there's a video with a bear, um, and it's just my handwriting, which is amazing. Um, I didn't ever expect this font to be a, downloaded and used, or used in another language to brand, um, across the other side of the world to brand a city. And a few weeks back, I actually got an email from someone in the US saying that Forever 21 has stolen my font and used it on a t-shirt and sent me a link. Um, instead of being angry, I was actually really flattered that someone would go and use it. And I was contemplating buying the t-shirt, <laughs> but I didn't. <laughs> so these are some of the other fonts that I'm playing with. Um, yeah, font making is so much fun. Um, definitely not I wouldn't call myself um, yeah, a typographer yet because it's really rough, but 
the lettering that you're doing for it is yeah, so much fun. This is a brush script that I'm trying to put together. It's got a lot more detail than um, the previous ones because that was through an automated program. So I'm just trying to figure out how to make this one. And I'm also doing a short course at TAFE for letter pressing. Um, so I want to make these letterpress impressions into a font as well. So this was another project that I worked on um, in collaboration with Dan. Um, it's a tool called Threedle, which is a social HR solution tool which links candidates to recruitment agents. Um, and it sits on the online space. So we wanted the identity to look um, different from what's online um, and give it a handcrafted, bespoke aspect, which links it back to the name Threadle, um, Thread and Needle. Um, so you can see the inspiration comes from, you know, the handcrafted aspect of me making jewellery and I would usually tie my jewellery and package it in twine. Um, and it's about making things um, organic and you know, putting, putting your, I don't know, your touch on things. Um, so that's a business card and it was actually put into um, the Communication Arts Typography <coughs> Annual, which was cool, along with Jessica Hish. Um, and then the final project that I'm going to show you is one for a land court development as well. It's a residential estate called Aurelia Trails. Um, and this is um, a development down in Quinana, which is based around, built around um, a trail called Aurelia Trails. And there's lots of natural flora and fauna around the area. So I looked at lots of the flora around the area um, and did some line illustrations. And we wanted to lay these out like a trail. Starting with the development itself. And creating trail and making it grow just like the residential development itself. Um, so I believe that an identity is never static. Um, you know, this can be, this can grow and grow, and it can be used in um, environmental applications. Um, it could be used in a small size, but depending on, like, depending on the application. Um, so for the brochure. We um, embossed the cover and you know really let the pattern stand out. And here's some dust sheeting. So um, working with nature, like the pattern can be used um, really boldly, or it can be used subtly over um, yeah nature as well. And to finish off with some signage. So we thought the back panel could be laser cut. And it kind of brings me back to yeah, my laser cut jewellery from before. Um, yeah, and how these elements all work together. So five things that inspire me. Obviously, making things by hand. I find that um, when I make things by hand, when I brush things out or write it, it really um, it means something personal to me, and it also gets me away from the computer, um, and it makes the ideas more unique and fresher. Um, as I said before, I'm currently doing a short course at TAFE, and um, yeah, I, find, I feel so inspired after it on Wednesday night. Just printing and pressing down with a letter press and getting inks and getting the hands dirty. Um, so nature is a huge inspiration. Just looking at growth patterns and noticing formations and um, changes in colour, shifts in colour over the day. Um, yeah, different seasons as well. People. Uh, people and the conversations and the thoughts that we have um, generate different thoughts and unique ideas. Travelling, this is probably a big one for me. Um, experiencing different cultures and their arts is, yeah, so inspiring. And just for the sake of work, last year I went on seven holidays. Um, <laughs> totally work related. <laughs> 
and by Pinterest. Um, so I know people say it's not cool to be on trend, but I think you have to know what's current and happening right now. And Pinterest is a great, it's such an easy way to um, yeah, see global trends or see designs from the other side of the world. So I think there's lots of ways to find inspiration. Um, and it's about broadening our worlds to create something unique. But it's still about finding a balance between the side projects and the work that we do. So when I was a student, or when I was just out of uni, I was doing a lot of that stuff. I was doing exhibitions and drawing, and I was um, laser cutting and um, running my design market stalls. Um, and that was a huge commitment. Now it's probably lessened, but I, I still see it as playing a huge part um, in inspiring the work that I do. So I think it's about finding a balance and it's different for everyone between play and work. So for me, inspiration comes from outside of what I'm working on. No project I've done exists in isolation. Um, I think they bleed into each other and um, you get inspired from other things and they don't exist separately out of my personal life or my work life. Um, it's kind of like how Steve Jobs said, um, you can only ever look back and connect the dots. And looking back, I can see how the projects that I've done, just like if I hadn't done illustrations, then I wouldn't have gone into hand, um, hand lettering. If I hadn't done hand lettering, then I wouldn't have done Clermont. Um, and that wouldn't have wrapped the whole development. I wouldn't have done um, the supernova event, the supernova entry that I um, yeah, completed. Um, and I would have, wouldn't have made the fonts that I did. Um, so it's all gone hand in hand. So five years on, I think it's the same things that have been inspiring me. And it's, bit, it's about creating things outside of work and living life every day. It's about bringing the experiences of everyday life, the feelings, the thoughts, challenges, perceptions, into our work to create something meaningful. Thank you for your time. speaker uh, has come to us all the way from Subiaco. <laughs> uh, excuse my notes. Um, he's one of Perth's most established and well-renowned designers. He's forged, forged a long career creating award-winning work in his studio, Rev Design. Uh, he is considered as one of the pioneers of Perth's design scene, so if you can please put your hands together for John and Marie. Good evening, everyone. Um, can I get an idea how many students are here tonight? Are there any? Okay, there's a few, so I'll make sure I speak to you in the proper terms when I'm going through this stuff. It, it was interesting today, you know, because I, I had to go shopping. I, I went to Woolies and I was pushing around the trolley because um, I'm a bit of a new age man, even though I'm only 61. And that's why I was pushing it around and sort of feeling the, feeling the goods. Mr. Dennis, how are you? Uh, I was listening to music. And as I was listening to the music, I was sort of grooving away a little bit. And then it occurred to me, I thought, oh, yeah, I remember designing this piece to this particular track. And then it really occurred to me, I thought, hold on, they only play old music in, in supermarkets. And I was, you know, the cranberries, U2, all this sort of stuff. So I kind of felt a little bit sort of strange about that. In fact, when I went home, I put the cranberries on just to get me. So. <laughs> yeah. so just so you all get a bit of an idea about me, um, this is my second profession. I didn't, I didn't become a designer until I was 34, that was my graduating year. Um, Neil Turner took me on. I was fortunate to work with the likes of Mr. Dennis over there, Paul Dennis, and uh, Roland Butcher, and 
Stephen Castle that I met. I was there for a couple of years until I launched off and got into my own business. Um, worked with a guy called uh, Stephen Rodriguez at the time, um, and it grew from there. What I'm going to show you tonight is a retrospective, obviously, and I've tried to, as best I, as I can, put it into some chronological order. Um, a lot of the work is really on that cusp. It's kind of pre-computer. So I'm going to take you through some of that with a bit of fun. This is the first bit. It's called the Wall Directory. It's only been out about a year and a half. And when I won this job for the, the Wall Corporation, they came to me and said, well, we want you to design something. We want it on a budget. And it's got to go out to like a 100,000 letterbox drop. Now, you guys probably all know about single-face e-flute. For students, if you know what cardboard's like, it's the thinnest cardboard you can get. But when I was designing this, they didn't have single-face e-flute e -flute readily available. What happened was I happened to have a piece of cardboard, and at the end of it was this single-face look just tailing off. And I thought, oh, this is really interesting. How can I make something interesting out of this? So I basically chopped it off, built this document or the visual at the time, and then I had to go to Ancor and say, can I get this sort of stuff? And they said, oh, that's called single face. I went, all right, I said, can I get it? And they said, you have to put in a special order for it. So it was interesting. Um, when this went out, 100,000 went out, and it was so popular that neighbors were nicking them from, from neighbors, which is, it was lovely to hear a long time. The other thing was, it was such a tight budget, I needed a child to photograph. And like all designers, in the end, I had to use my daughter. Now, <laughs> Leslie is in the audience tonight. She's 27 years old now. But what I really liked about this, and it, the reason why I'm showing you this, a lovely illustrator, a friend of Paul's, Bobby Hitchcock at the time, she did the illustrations. And we didn't have computers, or they were just coming in. So I had to get the black and white photo, and I had to cut it out, and I had to stick it on the visual so they could go and scan it, yeah. and they had to assemble it. So it went very, very well. Now my bank, I don't know if you know about this, but I'm very much into packaging. I've always loved to build packaging. This is the first, I guess, major job I got. It was for Vast Felix, and it was for what was called the Noble Riesling. Now, when they came to me and they said, okay, you won the job, design the reasoning, I decided I was going to do something else. And I went off and I designed this proprietary piece of packaging. And for students who don't understand what proprietary means, is it doesn't exist. You have to build something physically and work out how you're going to do it. I covered it in these, just a lovely craft paper that was printed with a, a lovely pattern varnish. And I thought, well, how am I going to tie this off? And I went out and found a, uh, it was a guy who produced leather strapping down in Fremantle. And I had to get in to go and cut all the leather to super long lengths and as thin as I could get it. So the client, when he came in, said, that's beautiful. And of course, I was you know, being reasonably astute. I said, well, you can have it, but it's going to cost you more money. And of course, he was seduced by it also. Mass Felix decided they'd use it. I put this in, not, it's a terrible shot. It's the only shot I have. But it's interesting that when you actually go to these places, big box ball factories, and you wander around, and it's really important to do that. When I got there, I noticed this machine. And it was a machine that they used, it had paraffin wax in, and they used to put the cardboard through to put a wax coating on it. And I said to the guy, what's that for? And he said, oh, it's to, um, is to protect, you know, when you put vegetables in boxes so the moisture doesn't go through. But it gave this beautiful effect over the cardboard. Every single piece of cardboard that you put through when it was flat had a different texture to it. You couldn't glue it. It had to be stapled down the sides of these brass staples all the way down the side. The clerk was wrapped in the idea. They had hot wax every box closed. So they got right into it, which was great. This was the, out of the packaging jobs that I'd been designing, per mint saw that I was doing. So they came to me and they said, oh, we'd like you to design packaging that we could, you know, mix and match, put all the different medallions and coins in, 
So when people buy them, we can sort of put a sticker on and send them away with it. So that's what I came up with at the time. I call that period brown period, because everything was really, really natural. <laughs> then we get into the beer period. So this is moving on about, I don't know, three years into, into, my, into my business at the time. And the first job we were uh, awarded, and this is with Swan Brewery. And it's kind of sad now when you think that, because back then, there were all these marketing managers down at Swan Brewery. Swan Brewery was part of Lion Nathan at the time, and they were sort of all around Australia. So they came to me and they said, OK, we want you to design Territory Bitter. I was getting really excited. Oh, yeah, great, Territory Bitter. Yeah, that'd be good. Brewed for a Territorian. Sound really good. I said, uh, where's it brewed? And they said, oh, it's just even better. We just put it in the can and send it up there. <laughs> <laughs> they said, they'll buy it. That's fine. <laughs> I put this one in because we were starting to get to this period. This is, this is, we've got computers at REM, I remember this well. But computers really couldn't manage Photoshop. They just, they could do it, but nothing really great. This job here, where we designed them, that uh, Swan Brewery at the time said to me, we want you to design these packs that are called Riverwood 30 packs. You know, like weight a ton, 30 cans of beer in them. And I had to go to Sydney to press pass all of these jobs on what were called Roland 800 presses. They were huge. Uh, it was, and it was, the place I went to was just, that was outside of Sydney. It was, it was like going to Quinana from Perth. So they stuck me in a hotel and I had to sit there waiting for this call. And I was sitting in Sydney for about four days waiting for these calls to come. I was wandering around all the shops buying stuff that I didn't need. Anyway, get this guy. I mean, he rings me one o'clock in the morning. He says, your jobs are on the press. <laughs> so I get this taxi driver. And I said, I've got to go down to this place. I'm driving and driving and driving. We get there. And I went, you can't leave. And this, is, this is nearly 20 years ago. I've got to remember this. And he said, you want me to stay? I said, you're going to stay. <laughs> it cost me $100 for him to stay 20 years ago. The beauty with these, and I'm sorry for digressing for that to tell you the story, but the beauty with these um, packs here is that all the images were photographed, and what I did with the, with the, um, the photographer, Leon Bird at the time, I said, look, I'm going to put this image under the glass, and I want to put all these beautiful little water droplets on the top. And you can sort of see when you look at them, there's all in here, there's all little, uh, little, like little magnifying glasses. So we photographed all those images at the back, and then we photographed the cans separately. In this period, it was all done on medium format, large film. And we had to get this guy who combined those images using masking and produced large transparencies. There was no computer at the time could actually manage that soft edges that you can get really easy in Photoshop nowadays. I don't know if anybody here remembers 1857. I think it's probably the oldest person in the room. So we went on, we designed 1857 and all the ancillary stuff that goes with it. Um, and this was really coming near the end of the beer period. We did pick up a lot of work for you know testing stuff. We did stuff for Han Ice and even stuff for um, Southwark Brewing in South Australia. We now came to the Berry Farm period, and the Berry Farm was a client of ours oh, for probably 10 years. And this is where we started to, and I had a lot of fun getting into um, more exotic packaging, I guess if you want to call it. I think this is one of the first pieces I picked up an anchor award with. Um, the, the bottle's Italian, and that's not a big deal now, but back then, sourcing bottles and getting them was really, really hard. And I started to get into this period where I went, oh, I just want to do something different. I was getting really, really annoyed that, you know, you'd look overseas and people would design things and have medallions and stuff put on bottles. So I went and found this company. Now, that's another thing. I've, I've just got to get out of the normal graphic design circles or printing circles. And I found this company that could cut discs and things and etch brass and all the rest of it. So they, that's where I started to come up with these ideas in the dalliance. This is a vinegar. 
that this is a really big thing again. This is one and a half liter bottle. I mean, it stood this high off the table. It was a big mother. In fact, it was so big, we had three of them. I had them for years. The other day I said to my wife, I've got to throw these out. I said, we're not getting through this vinegar. It's just so much <laughs> <laughs> the, um, I've got to give credit to other people that worked on these jobs too. A lovely guy, uh, Liam Barr, who doesn't do design anymore. And he illustrated work with us and did all the illustrations on it. And uh, I think all he does now is he's, he's an artist. That's how they are now, very <coughs> mundane, 375ml bottle, you can get through in a couple of months. <laughs> <laughs> the sauces. It was nice to me. The jams. I put this in here because uh, there's a lovely lady, um, uh, Meredith Hardy. Uh, I don't know if anybody here remembers Meredith Hardy. Probably one of Perth's best illustrators in my opinion. She had such a beautiful skill. She could put her hand to anything and had all this, I don't know, classic knowledge. And as we go through with this lot, I'll sort of flip, you'll see things, I'll make mention of it. But this was for the Berry Farm as well. It was Bourne Hill, and I came up with the idea of the bird towing the car with a key in its beak. You know, it must have been drinking too much. <laughs> Getting into proprietary stuff is a little bit, again, it comes up here. Uh, this is. Um, came up with this idea, they said, oh, Berry Farm said we want to have a vinegar and an olive oil. And I thought, oh, vinegar and olive oil. So I went, oh, v &O. that's original. So I developed a little v &O motive and decided that what we'd do is come up with the story of the origins of why people dip their bread in olive oil and vinegar. That was a nightmare. We're we went around town, we were speaking to chefs. Eventually, we got an Italian chef who said, Look, it's no different to, you know, you English when you, you have traditions. He said, You know, Mama was cooking the meal, nobody could wait, so to keep them away, she just had some on the table and they did. So we wrote a romantic little piece around that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's important because that, that scripting, that writing, is as much the part of that brand as the, the you know, everything else about it. I did get into it again, I, was, I, I hated uh, what you call uh, fortified stoppers. Do you guys know what fortified stoppers are? The, you know, the knurled tops, they're plastic, bit of a core, ugly as sin. I started following up with repetitive engineers. Now, I don't know if you know what a repetitive engineer is, they're guys that use lathes. Part of my background is I've worked in a bit in engineering, so I was pretty up with this. And I spoke to this guy and I said, look, what I want to do is I want to spin an aluminium top, but I want to be able to snap the, the, the cork and pack into the underside of the aluminium top. So a repetitive engineer did some work for me. We looked at it and it looks great. He just threw them all out and the client just clipped them all in. They wouldn't come out once they went in. And that form, there I saw the top of the label going around. So I thought, well, at least we could dress these things up a bit. Goundry, um, I think most people have worked for Goundry for a while. Uh, we did, we created that, that particular look there back in 1996. The Goundry box, Goundry carbon. I thought I'd show that because it is kind of cute. This is the piece uh, that we were fortunate to well, have a, a pinnacle award for this and an innovation award. And this piece, Liam Barr worked me on. And we were doing away, and a credit to Liam, he sort of said, oh, what happens if we stick, stick a label, if we could do something up on a neck? And I went, it's not gonna work unless we really, really think this out. So I went away. And I came back with this idea of designing the label so that it would fix in a particular way on the back. But what happens when it comes up, it falls down. This here is a, is a brass disc. And I've been to boot makers. If you ever go out to these boot making places and sort of just forage, I'm talking about really, really big boot makers, they have all these rivets and things. That rivet there, you can you'll buy thousands of them, tens of thousands, dirt cheap, and I thought, right, we're on the money here. 
So I've got this other crowd to etch the, br the brass top and punch them out. And I said to them, can you cover them up like the bronze river thing? And they said, not a worry in the world. So I just brought them both together and they just basically folded the label over the top, put the disc on and pushed it into the river. And it just stuck there like it was a really long shaped river. The other thing was, is to perforate it around the top. So what happens when the client gets it, they ping off the, the brass thing, you think, oh, I'll keep that, and they tear off this perforated top, and it was a beautiful line. And when you pour the wine, any of the dribbles that run down would just run into the label. So it really took the concept of taking the label from the body up onto the neck. We're all skeletons now, can't do that. <laughs> Lime and Chill, um, same client, same idea, aluminium top, acid edge bottle, out of Italy. Um, if you look at the illustration, the client says, I want something Australian in this. I went, oh yeah, right. There's a couple of little kangas right there. <laughs> <laughs> you love it. Actually, I must tell you a story. Another story. The sad fact was with that, it was actually um, a liqueur. Paul Baker, what happened was he made all this stuff and then customs and excise came along and said you haven't paid enough money and they, they put tape all around it and said you can't sell it. it took him months, months to get through. Oh, this is the Berry Farm. This is a purely at girls, nothing to do with boys. Uh, berry Farm kept along came and they said oh we've got a cherry liqueur. I went oh okay. So I picked a bottle and I sat there one evening in the kitchen. I was doodling away. I thought, oh, yeah, I'll have this script on the front. And Meredith Party again, this illustrator I was telling you about. And I thought, oh, I want to have an illustration that has like a nice little cherry tree. And I thought, you know, that sort of Elizabethan period, something a bit romantic. She handled it, not a problem. The brass top, yeah, it, repetitive engineering again. And it, what happened with this was, it actually has a, like a thread in it. So they're all made. And the client, once there were a bottle, just screwed them right in and it was a glue and they just locked on. So that's how it worked. Cuba, bit of silliness. Uh, this client, Solerum, Solerum Port, I think they call it. Um, basically, said, I want a port. I thought, port, port cigar, port cigar, Cuba, Cuba. Oh, so he said, yeah, so we basically decorated that. Silliness came out again. I thought I designed a top that you had to have screw. I, I laughed and I said, this is really going to piss people off. <laughs> they don't have a screwdriver. <laughs> uh, Wamco. Uh, the Wamco job was uh, interesting. Um, and it's actually been sensible. Um, when uh, the West Australian, West Australian Mead Marketing Corporation came to me, they said, oh, I want you to design a brand that's going to work internationally. These, these guys are fairly big. And we're coming up with all these ideas. And um, a lovely designer who worked for me at the time, Phil May, I said to him, look, can you, you know, knock me up in Italy of this? Now, I decided you should use a pastoralist because people on packaging, you know, see sheep, cows, whatever, the lamb, I can't do that. So I thought, use the pastoralist because the pastoralist is, you know, he's the symbol of, you know, Good care, taking care of things. Anyway, he, Phil did knock something up for me and I worked on it into the night. I did these big photocopies, moving time from around, getting rid of most of the illustration. And I knew it was going to work in the morning because I had this lovely designer, Janet Tagliano, who worked for us. And I said, Janet, I said, have a look at this, what do you reckon? And she looked out and she said, oh, he could put his boots under my bed any time. <laughs> <laughs> But the client said, no, it is perfect, and it works. Uh, and it stood the test, they still use it, which is nice. Huh. This, this was a great job. It was a really, really good job. Um, most condom packaging is pretty horrible, in my opinion. And when we were awarded this job, I said to the, I, I said, look, we've got to get girls and guys working on this. I don't want, I don't want 
just boys, because I know it's all going to be, you know, six packs and all the rest of it. And I just wanted to have a really, really good balance. And this is what came out. And what was nice for this was that we came up with these little, in a lot of ways, they're logical, little symbols like the key, you know, representing something precious, um, the feather, you know, a plaything or a peace offering. Whatever. So they were, this is where we, we went, okay, I'm going to have all these high chroma colours. The client um, at the time, you know, he drove a really hard bargain. And he's come, he actually he's still a really good friend of mine. His birthday is exactly the same day as mine. He's the same age. So about once every five years, we get together and have, have a birthday party. Do you have balloons? No, but we did. We had the sort of delight to have <laughs> But the nice thing was with this, he, he, this packaging did so well across Australia, it was ranged in all the supermarkets, that Seaton Shop, who owned Durex, said, we want to buy the brand. And he said, I don't want to, he was Jewish, he said, I don't, I don't, I don't want to sell the brand. And they said, we're going to buy the brand, or we're going to make life really hard for you. So he said, okay, he sold. And he said to me, smiling, he said, they, they, they paid me a lot of money. And that's a fantastic reading. Anyway, he said, look, you should contact them. So I sent them this letter. And I said, look, congratulations. You bought a brand. Really happy for you. Uh, just wanted to let you know. Put all the artwork here. It's all backed up. It's all safe. Oh, bye-bye. Uh, we own intellectual property. <laughs> I get a call from Sydney. And um, this guy says to me, <clears throat> You own the intellectual property? I said, yeah, yeah. I said, I can show you the paperwork. He said, no, 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 no. He said, that's fine. Um, he said, would you charge much for assigning the intellectual property? And I had this figure. I already had it. I was ready for this tour. And the figure was four times what we'd actually charge for the design services. <laughs> so he said, no, oh, no, no, we won't pay that. He said, look, tell you what. He said, we'll let you do more work. And I said, if you give it to us, and I said, no, 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 no. I said, and you can't copy what we've done because we own the intellectual property. So he went, ah. Oh. He said, all right, what the heck? He said, let's just do the work. A year later, almost to the day, he rings me. He said, what was that figure? Because England won. And there you go. So stick by your guns, be professional. Uh, this one here, this is one job I, I refuse to actually do any photo art direction. And the reason was, uh, this was for a, um, a prospectus called No Regrets. And it was a beautiful prospectus. Gemma Taviano, Phil May, uh, not Phil May, Phil, Phil, uh, Phil, Phil, uh, Phil, uh, Phil Sir. Anyway, it doesn't matter. They were, yes, were working with me. And I said to Gemma, I said, look, we're going to have to take some really beautiful shots of women. And I said, I don't want guys being involved. I really think a female should do it because female will know how far to push. Mm -hmm. And she did a great job. Um, in fact, this was the most popular prospectus amongst all the stockbrokers in town at the time. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Bruma. Now, this is part of Sugi's institution. You know, it's all, it's there. I have to give credit to my wife here, um, because my wife actually came up with the name. Um, there was a guy called Brian McCutcheon. He used to have the tea and coffee merchant. Canadian guy. And he comes along and he says, oh, look, I've seen your work. And you are, you are sort of all family uh, in Sudiaco. And he said, look, I'd, I'd really be interested in you designing this. So he came, my wife, of course, came with Bruja. Then I thought, OK, I'm going to have a bit, of a bit of a strap line, something to work around. So I came up with the ritual. And a guy called Patty Smith, who now works in, um, in Canada, keeps in touch. Um, he did all the illustrations. So we had Chief Jam Man, Queen Hubba Hubba, <laughs> and the client's son came up with that, so I can say that, and we call them the psychiatrists. There were about 24, 24 characters in this, which I really liked. <coughs> Cups, stuff, all that normal stuff. Some of the illustrations. Down is to the outside. <coughs> Side is the outside. Woman in the inside. 
this is what I enjoy, and, and this is, I kind of like getting into this holistic branding side of things. So we wrote this uh, Bruha definition, uh, you know, the ritual of consuming the highest quality teas and coffees, particularly whilst engaging in spirit and debate. And just that little image, you know, cheap jab man out there throwing a spear, spear breaks, <laughs> going to have a, have a coffee. Life's not bad, you know, so. <coughs> oh, got to tell you about this. I came up with this honcho mixer pledge. I couldn't help it. Just, just, you know, I was sitting there one day and it just ran off the pan. That, you know, this tea, this coffee, better than best, better than best. You like, you make my heart warm. You don't like, I give you a little of that, okay. About three years ago, this thing has been out in the marketplace for, I don't know, 15 years? The guy, the West Australian newspapers, cites this as being politically incorrect. The client rang me, the new client, and said, what do you reckon we should do? I said, just ignore it. I, I thought, you know, political correctness is going crazy. Uh, this is one of my kind of earlier favourite pieces. Um, a lovely designer, uh, Louisa Rhinelander. Uh, she's got Manifesto, uh, and she does some really nice labels. Um, uh, I don't know how she gets this on, so high on Google, but it's brilliant. When this client came to me, they said, oh, we've got a company, we're going to produce all this uh, antipasta. Okay. And they said, it's called Pickle Factory. And I said, oh, that's soulless, isn't it? Pickle Factory. So I was able to convince them to get rid of the wine and replace it with an eye. And I kind of then, you go, oh, Pickle Factory. You know, it started, it started to work. And I, the, the, the motive here, which I'll, is that better? I sat there and I sort of thought, oh, factory, cop, okay, you know, lots of fruit stuff around it. Um, and I'm sure you guys, Brandon and everybody else knows, it. yeah, this is Malcolm, Malcolm Lindsay, you know, Scribbles. I don't know why the man calls his business Scribbles, because he's, uh, he's such a, a beautiful illustrator. And he rendered this for me. What I did like with that piece of packaging was, I said to uh, Louisa, I said, I really kind of want to do something different with this. So I wrote all this text to one side. So it's a bit yin and yang. One side's all English. And I said to Louise, I said, do you reckon you can find anybody who could translate this into Italian? And she knew some guy that was, um, I don't know, it was a lecturer in Italian or something. And he sat there and he wrote all that text, rewrote it. And of course, we were into script writing, serious copying. You know, you can't just kern it and do whatever, you've got to space it, you've got to letter write it. Oh, all the words have to be for the right amount of characters. This is an example of um, designing something for, ah, it didn't exist. This is when uh, all the angry business, angry businesses were out there and they were sort of pumping new ideas and this one was for a whole new winery. So this client came to me and said, oh, we've got a big new winery. It's called Cario. I hated the name. I went, okay. So we developed a prospectus, but I said, why don't we create a brand? Create, sell, sell, sell the brand. So he went, oh, I like that idea. So we actually went the journey of not only creating a prospectus, but creating, and it was all around craft and science elements, before elements of the brand <coughs> came out and creating all this packaging. And it was all, all the bottles were properly fired, everything that had been run on them, um, did the boxes, yeah. The whole thing went to ground, I think. This job is for a crowd called Inglewood Elements. So um, they came to us and we had to develop a whole branding and packaging. I mean, there was quite a large program of work that I'm not gonna go into, but I had to use Richard Gale over at Gale Force because what we wanted to do, and here's the first one, I wanted to design, I wanted to create, I had this idea of a view where is it a floor or is it a wall? So easy to do nowadays. In some ways, Steve Boris, uh, he's over at um, uh, Brain Cells, he was working with us at this time. And it was, it took two weeks to this whole shoot, because there were like 16 shots 
And what we had to do, we got up in the, the heavens at Gale Force back then, had this guy do all these backdrops. They were all built. They weighed a ton to move around. Got up from the top, propped everything, photographed it. Later on, after doing all the various products, pulled the boards up, had to jiggle the lighting so it looked the right when it, like when it was up from above, and put products in front of them that way, and then everything was combined. So it was a big job. And it went really well. It went to it. All this stuff was really meant for the American market, so it was a good promotion. The, the green series. And the sandstone series. It's starting to get into that kind of more, I call it, minimal look. Um, Carl Wallman worked with me on this one. Um, this is an invitation from the Perth Mint in conjunction with another crowd, I think they're called Beaumont Catering or something. And they said, oh, I want you to do something, send out all to the corporate sector. And I'm like, oh, here I go. And we want something different. So in the end, we decided that we'd get a couple of pieces, we'd get this wood. They're all about that big. We silk screened the invitation on them and then wrapped it in this lovely stock. It's called Ever, as I remember. Beautiful stock. Can't get it over here nowadays. And then I've used this process with wax seals in the past. I don't know if you know. I'll tell you a story about this in another one. But put the black wax seal with the cord, and then they were wrapped and they're sent out. They, it was a roaring success because all the people in the corporate sector went, "Oh, this is really different." So I've just broke ground, I guess. Uh, three drops. Uh, three drops is one of those jobs where you go. How do we kind of step away a little bit? So created more of a minimal contemporary label. But at the same time, what I don't like, um, I have to be honest about this, I think wine notes, as a rule, on wine bottles are a real wank. I, I mean that because I just think that how many people turn the bottle over and religiously read the wine notes? I'm, I'm sorry, if you, if, if you, you know your wines, you know. So we got into things like writing these lovely little uh, pieces about, well, where is it? I've got it here, guys. My first bit of reading. It's not, not much. <laughs> here it is. Yeah, here's a typical one. Uh, unknowingly, the sun had dropped some rays which were eagerly gathered by the conspiring vines. And putting that on the front, it sort of, it was, there was more to the brand culture than sticking a wine note on. I don't know if you, uh, the client at the same time, after a while, they said, oh, we'd like to do something different and in terms of our promotion. And I have this book at home, I've had it for years. Uh, I don't know if any of you have heard about a photographer called Serge Lutens. If you get the chance, go and look up Serge Lutens. Serge Lutens was responsible for the imaging of a lot of the big fashion houses um, um, in, in, in France. And he was a photographer. And this book that I had, I remember looking at it and thinking, it's beautiful. And all the females, the way he'd make them up, they were totally white-faced. And I thought, well, hold on. Maybe we, if we look at that stuff that Serge Lutens did and create this almost androgynous-looking character, and really, this is what came out of it, and then she's been used, or he's been used in this catch drop of three. Um, so it worked really, really nicely. Uh, this here is their old boy. Um, what happened was Carol Wallick, myself, and another de designer, and named Fatigas, as I remember, were working on this. Um, it's fired to the bottle, and it used to have a different outer. And about four years ago, the client came back to me and said, look, can you redesign some label that will work? Because it's a difficult bottle to work with because of the, the, the complex curves. Um, so this is what I've designed, that roll on. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing, stands the test of time. This job is an example of taking something that, and part of it is based on something that I found many, many, many years before. When this client came to us, they said, oh, we've got, it's uh, New Norcia Bakeries. They said, we'd like you to design a piece of packaging for a pan forte product. And I went, oh, that's great. And they said, it's got chocolate in it. And I went, oh, that's even better. And they said, 
we've, we've got a name for it. They said, oh, what is it? They said, we're going to call it the New Nausea Dom Salvado Centenary Cake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I thought. So I went away and um, we did some thinking in the studio. And in the end, I came back and said, well, let, let's create this as a bit of a brand in its own, Dom Salvado, from New Nausea. But I said, we have an actual name for it. And they said, oh, what's the name? And we said, Pan Chocolate. And I went, geez, that's good, isn't it? And I went, yeah, I said, it's a whole new product category, you see. I said, you own it. What do you reckon about that? And I went, yeah, we like it. So, also, New Norcia is a business in its own, right? It isn't part of the monastery up there. But they have this kind of licensing agreement for the monastery. So I said, look, what I really like is to get some verbiage, wordage, but I'd like it in different languages. And they said, well, what do you mean? And I said, you know, premium quality, because Don Salvador, he was Spanish, but the monks all speak Latin. So this stuff up the sides is in Latin and Spanish. And the monks just got off on it. They really <laughs> And behind here, there's all this type that's written. That's all that they wrote. It's all in Latin, and it's all behind there. The story I wanted to tell you, oh, this part here, I came up, I thought, oh, Don, do I can't do do And I wrote, I designed that little mark, the, the mark of the Don. I don't know why I came up with a cross in the center. I wanted to get rid of the O, because it just would have been a bit, a bit, when you say the Don, it's a bit, kind of Italian mafia at that point. <laughs> but what I wanted to talk to you about is this. I brought this up. I've been out about one year, two years, in, in, no, one year in business, my first year, the year I was 34. And I was flipping through this book, and I saw this image of a bunch, bunch of monks. They're all standing there in a the group. And it was a woodcut from about I don't know, 800. I don't know, oh, look at that. And there was this one monk, looking sad, you know, head on, head on the side, and I look, geez, I love that guy. Back then, we used to have what was called Reaper Master cameras. So I shoved this book under me, blew the shit up out of it, got it as big as I could, then I had to work away, you know, fixing it all up, because this is so old. And I put it away. And I put it away for 10 years, because I went, one day, don't know when, that little face is going to be used. So, moral of the story is, put them on my Don't put them on the computer, put them in the drawer. <laughs> Followed on with Nutcake, Guy Pratt, um, who had worked with me on the Dom Salado. Um, he worked on this one, and um, it's a lovely piece, and the whole development of the New Norcia brand mark. The interesting thing is, with this pack, they came, when they came to us, they said, we've got this pan forte. And the two partners, you could see there was a bit of tension. And I said, oh, right. And one of them looked at me and he said, it's bloody hard. My mum can't cut it. <laughs> and the other one said, oh, it's not that hard. And in the end, we sort of looked at them and said, no, it's simple. And they said, what? They said, why don't you just cut them in half for the customers, or bake them in two halves, and seal them in two separate packs in the box? And I went, oh, that's clever. <laughs> so I went, OK. And they said, oh, and you can produce a half size pack. They got really excited about that. But what was even better about these things is they're a cake. They're round. You get a piece, you get a cave this in a vacuum form pack, you can't stand it up, it just falls over. It's terrible shelf presentation. These, and we designed these proprietary packs, can stand up. And they were a treat. Myers got hold of this, and the client was wrapped. He was in Myers in Sydney. He said they had full on displays of it. He said it was great, but even nicer with this. We went, nut cake. I hate it. The, the name nut cake. I make no bones about it, but I thought if you've got something you don't like, go really go the distance. And we wrote these pieces about nuts, like this one here. Pecans in the past have been notoriously wild nuts. 
favour and coveted by native North Americans, it took four centuries to tame these tempestuous nuts and disappear into cultivation. <laughs> so, all of a sudden, the nuts have some carrot. So, beautiful piece, work the tree. Next was the biscotti. And all this packaging that I'm showing you is still being used. They haven't changed it, which is wonderful. So, we've, somehow we've finished with these, we've finished with uh, these beautiful Pancorde products, and out of nowhere, we go up and see if they came back to us. And they initially came to us to design a brand for a, a liquid fertilizer product. Anyway, they said, yeah, that worked really well, we'll see you again. <clears throat> so we went out and saw them, and I was sitting there with them, and they were pretty honest, actually. They said, look, we're going to be up front with you. We have a really, really bad reputation with farmers, because farmers see us as ripping them off, you know, charging them a lot of money for the fertilizers. You know, we want to change that. I went, oh, okay. Anyway, I got in the car, and I'm talking about, you know, the future of farming, blah, blah, blah. I got in the car, and I was driving back, and it was like, you know, this epiphany. You just, I just went, this is so logical. I rang them up, and I said, look, what you're talking about in terms of wanting to partner with all these farmers is the future of farming, right? You know, good relationship. And they went, yeah. I said, have you ever thought about calling it all CSVP Future Farm? And there was this long silence on the end of the phone, and they went, oh, we really like that. So they rushed off, registered it. They didn't, you know, CSVP, CSVP still existed as an entity. And we ended up, uh, put it on for about three years, designing all this material, going up country, uh, uh, meeting farmers, meeting farmers' wives, you know, um, really getting to know what their issues were, designing stuff which was around uh, how they were going to help them, how they were going to work with them, uh, packaging for things like they call you know soil sort of analysis kits, and you can sort of see how we started to can, you know carry all this branding um, across. Uh, there was things like sky plan. My first career was a cartographer. So I understood about remote sensing technologies and stuff like that. So, um, you know, it's very, very beneficial there. We had uh, Richard Gale, <coughs> Leon Bird, and we had two, two photo studios having to do all the work. We had, had to get choppers in to do shots like this. It was pretty full on. And I put this one here because this always makes me smile. These Four guys here, these agronomists that get into interpreting all the sky plan, all the images, all the satellite images. And typically they, they say, oh, we've got to have a photo of this. And I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. So we're designing this brochure. And they came along to the studio. And typically they were there, they were all in their, in their suits with their, with their ties on. The day before, I don't know what made me think about this, I, was, I had sky plan, I was driving along. And I thought of the Thunderbirds. You know Thunderbirds? Yeah. And I went, you know, Thunderbirds, I've oh, got Thunderbird 1, Thunderbird 2, Thunderbird. I thought, oh, I thought, oh, a bit of fun here. So we got these t shirts got done really quick. Anyway, they turn up, they've got their ties on, they've got their suits on. And I said, guys? They said, yeah. I said, take them off. <laughs> and they went, what? I said, take them off and put <coughs> these on. And I got them to put these t shirts on, and I said to Richard, Go at the time. I said, Richard, on the floor, guys, rugby huddle. And they took this shot, and it is, there's so, there's, you can see, they are just happy. They're laughing because they didn't have to stand there and look like idiots. Um, and it worked a treat because all the farming community, when they saw them, they just laughed and identified them because all these images were used in really, really big expositions and things like that up and down. Other stuff gives you a bit of a feel, a lot of work we have to do, you know, canola, the full Monty, all that sort of stuff. Um, a lot of fun. And all this, all the things about fertilizers. So it gives you an idea of how we created this whole brand culture around a thing like that. More logos that you can poke a sticker, had to design a logo for every single fertilizer they had. We were so sick of fertilizers. <laughs> 
this is a generic mistake. Um, uh, what, this job here, um, when they came to us, um, I, I had it in the back of my head for a while that I wanted to create a slip-on label on a bottle. Um, so when you do that, you have to have a, a bottle that's got a little bit of a, a taper to it for grab, uh, so you can sort of slide them on really easily. Use this stock snap I think it was. Lo lovely, beautiful textured stock. All the labels are really, really heavy. I mean, we're talking probably at least 350, maybe 400 GSM stock. The bottles, I got out of Italy. And what I did was um, I basically had them all printed in Italy and they shipped the whole lot out over here. What I did do with this, and it's a good thing to remember if you're interested in getting into packaging. Um, when you get into packaging, that sort of idea is great. But what I did do with this one is I go on to um, engineering crowds that produce labeling machines. I spoke to crowds over in Sydney, I sent them all the details, and I said, could you apply that sort of thing automatically? And they said, yeah, not a problem. The client that wants to do that. So I kind of covered my ass because I think it's great doing things, but you don't want the cottage industry for the rest of their lives. Uh, frivolous little um, low alcohol manual girls uh, from the berry farm. I put it there because I liked it. Um, and um, Enrico Bettersworth, who worked with us, and now he's went to Lemonade, and he's now design director at Rare. Um, lovely guy. Um, I was going through a book and I saw this image of 1920s, all these images of, you know, Vogue illustrations, black and white ones, and that was the influence for the, for the woman. And then, of course, you know, a bit of Clint in there and just brought it together. So, it's a bit girly, but it's nice. Uh, 34 degrees south, the client had the name. We seem to be getting into all the walls now. I don't know why, it goes in waves, you know. You get one on the wall, you get another one and another one. Um, but what I liked for this is about four years ago they came back and they said, oh, we need some Dukkha packaging. And I thought, oh yeah, um, I'm happy with that. Um, couldn't use the big server thing, so I used it as the window. Um, worked well. Another roll of oil, low fag. Most of these are on the shelf, exactly as they are. You know, Dan Derriman, low fag, three rocks. They've been out there for years, they haven't changed. Your lumber came to us. Uh, they said we want a uh, we want a wine out of Western Australia. They actually partnered Vans Felix, and I said okay. And they said we want you to develop a brand name. Uh, and I went, oh, right. So I, my daughter Leslie was actually I remember the date. She was 15. She was doing work experience of all places down the very far. And while she was there, I went out and got books and was reading up on wildflowers and all the rest of it. And I don't know how I found this information. I was looking at a, a map. I saw this, this thing, Reebok. I thought, oh, Reebok, what's that? It was one of a ship, a, a ship that actually uh, sunk. It was bringing concrete cement to Western Australia donkeys years ago. But I thought, oh, Reebok's, hold on, you know, they use them with you know, horses and all the rest of it. They had them as it stays on the end of the posts and down the wineries where you hang the wines on. So I thought, well, that sounds good. And hence, you know, hold them fast, work them hard, build a heritage. It's all about that fury stuff. So it worked. It's simple. And the reason why they wanted this, they said, we cannot release any more wine into the off license into the UK. We need to have a different, another brand for a really good wine. So that was really designed for the, that area over there. And it's, it's still going. It's, it's grown in numbers. Berry farm again. Uh, they had all these ports, so many ports. So in the end, they, they said we're, we're thinking of having a port house. So I just like this. It's simple. It's before other wines have come out, with number ones, number twos, and number threes. You know, they said, well, why don't we just create a lovely concept around the port house series? Um, and it worked well. Here's the port house. Here's the port. Uh, now, this is Wallura. Um, there's a guy called Peter Gavel. He was uh, Kerry, Kerry Stokes' right-hand man. A really, really lovely man. His family, they own um, a big property um, 
down on Walton Road. And he said to me, I need, this is a nightmare job actually, he said, I want something beautiful design. And this would have been, I would have had about a month. He said, and I went right, and he said, I want a really, really lovely piece of packaging. And he said, because we're flying out to see family in Colorado, even though it's Scottish, they're all met from around the world. Right. So I created the Walura brand, and I thought, I really want to create a proprietary box for it, because I knew I had to do that. So what happens with this box, I'm just, I've got a dodgy shot just after this, is that, see the piece of stick there? What I thought was, okay, I'm going to build this box out of e flute because I, I knew a lot about e-flute and what it would do. You can laminate the papers to it. And that piece of stick there, you just pull that and all the cord fell away. This here, this is a proper wax seal. And I dealt with another guy who had to build stuff with me at one stage. And I discovered that it's a handle to tip this. If you ever want to pour sealing wax and you want to form a beautiful shape, you have something made, and you have it made out of the same material they use for dentures, because sealing wax does not stick to it. So we would have these little units, and you just pop them down and pour the wax in and then plunge the mark in, and it was perfect shape every time. So they, we produced about 400 of these, and we had to get this whole job done. It was a nightmare in about one month. I mean, design, build, had people silk screening up there, printing the labels. It's not brilliant, but the inside, I used that Everstock that I mentioned earlier, and there's left and right are these two tubes, and actually what they are is 25 mil reticulation pipe, because I wrapped this paper on, but it actually had some function to it, because that cord went through the bag, you pull it in as tight as you wanted, and then wrapped around the box, and went around the, um, the little dowel piece that I had made as well. So, it, you know, there is, you know, you could, the whole thing about form follows function, actually, follows through with this. We then ended up in Indonesia, uh, ended up by Sun Plaza, but, you know, that's what they wanted. Years before I've seen something similar to this in the UK, so we designed all these pieces, and Sun Plaza, and I thought, I hate the name, what can we do? to make it a bit different. So I thought, well, hold on, one thing around the world that's common is they all have sun gods of one form or another. So the architects up in Indonesia and the client went, oh, we really, really like that. So we literally did all these illustrations, designed all the specs for all these poles, and this guy up in Indonesia built countless pieces of these and all sorts. They're all different, all different sun gods from around the world. Internal signage, more internal signage. What the hell? So, oh, one thing, it wouldn't happen here in Perth. The thing that got me up in this, this isn't the dam, that shopping centre. It was a big place, huge. You'd walk in under these shops, they'd be operating. You'd walk 50 metres, and there'd be people dust, dust, and dust. You'd go another 100 metres, there'd be concrete. And you go, another, they were literally building this shopping centre, and you could see it, like over here, they go, we can't do that. They did it up there. Colonial. Uh, I hate the name again. Can't stand it. But, as the client said, you know the period that's coming from. I want, I want the name. You can't register Colonial, so we created just a simple brand name. This is the series of. Um, beers of the time. Um, he had four all-year beers, four seasonal. Meredith Party again, I got her in. And I said to her, I said, look, I want all of these illustrations. I want everything's got to focus on the eye. It's really, really important. The nicest thing with this is, it's great to go back to stuff that you have. I have this book. I have donkey's years. It's called Australia's Yesterday. It's not the sort of thing you probably look at much. When I was doing this, I was reading through, doing my research, and I came across this thing on a guy called Dr. Quick. And this is true. Don't laugh. This is true. So, it has some reason. Um, 
Born in 1852, Dr. John Quick was a lawyer and persuasive political lobbyist. He coaxed, cajoled, and bullied those of influence, but often under the influence, into holding the watershed referendum, which led to federation in 1901. Point was, Adam, you go, a name like Dr. Quick for a colonial beer, it's kind of like Dr. Quick the medicine man, and you go, that's perfect, but it's actually part of our history. So we wrote that story around that. This one here, the client said, oh, I want something sportive. And you go, there wasn't any Aussie rules. It didn't exist. So I was flipping through this same book again, and they talked about, you know, back in the old days, these troops, boxing troops, would go bush. The farming days would come along, Spruker would be out the front and say to the lads, you take in the box if you can knock them out, blah, blah, blah. So we created Spruker's Challenge. So it was great to sort of think that out of that, you know, we could create a, a brand culture that, even though it was sort of colonial looking, fitted with the time. <coughs> you see that image over there? Little story. And tell to me people this. When I was doing my, when I was at Kurt or way back then, Stanley, I thought oh, I'll do multimedia. And I thought I'd do one of those A V shows, all the slides. So I was about 31 at the time. And I came up with this idea of doing an A V on uh, the building of the dam and the reasons why they, you know, had to go in bush and up to Calville, etc. I went into the back in library and I said to the lady what I was doing. I said, so I need to photograph stuff. They went, oh. They said, look, tell you what. They said, if you bring a camera in, we'll give you a room, and you can go through all the files. So I took this camera, put a, um, I had a grid in there, an architectural type grid, set stuff up, photographed all these photos. It was great. Use it for my A and B, plus my degree. So I had all these slides. I threw them 90% of them white and bought them. There were about half a dozen I thought. Is really nice. I'll put those away. <laughs> Fifteen years later, well, sixteen years. There you go. So lovely image. Shows the applications, you know, to all the stuff you have to. And Enrico Bexworth, who I mentioned, who worked with us on all of this, he was into Flash at the time when you could do websites in Flash. And we had a lot of fun creating all this kind of look, etc. And there you go, actually got to design the bar. Signage all the way through. Here's a bit of it. Does it still exist? And there's a the detail. And the toilets. And there's stuff on the doors. And I love this, you know, here is living proof. God loves us and wants to see us happy. <laughs> they reckon that everybody that went to the tours was to sit there and laugh for a while because there it was, something to read on the back of the doors. A lot of fun. And the exterior. And having to get a proper sign writer, as in a real sign writer, to work on that machine. An exterior signage. Uh, <coughs> AU, dot AU, um, or, or uh, printed, uh, produced in France for a, uh, an Australian uh, vodka. Uh, I don't know uh, what happened was, and it really actually ended up coming up with the name, that it could be registered because they wanted to be able to release it internationally. But what happened was uh, that the French called this dot owl. So they don't know who's dot owl is. This is an example of trying to design a proprietary bottle because the client didn't want to pay the French, so it went to China to do this version, which is a version of the other. The only problem was the Chinese couldn't get the thread right. So after he produced them, put the screw cap on, they all leaked. So they had to stick with the French. Uh, this number, um, I put this in here because it's a bit of fun. Um, we were asked, and it was all the time when it was all political, we were asked by the Wine Industry Association to um, create a campaign for West Australian wines. And it was mainly for the American market and places like that. So essentially what happened was, I don't know if any, I came up with this idea of an ancient land, a new world, a western edge, 
because it is an ancient land. New world is what we are, new world wines, and <coughs> Western edge, which is good. Um, so we created this new name for it, Australia West Dominion of Wine. Um, the image, of course, the woman, just that little token sort of, you know, um, not to the, the indigenous peoples. For the, and I, I kind of wanted it a bit timeless. And some people said to me, oh, I said, what was the influence for that? And I said, well, actually, I said, have you, have you guys seen Contact, you know, Jodie Foster? That movie there, there's a scene where she kind of meets her dad, but it's not her dad later in, you know, once the aliens have got her. Um, there's this scene, and it's all kind of a little, little bit surreal. I was stuck in my head, and I thought, I like that. I love that surreal feel to it. So I wanted to create this surreal image for this. That's where it came from. This is for Spices Paper. Um, they came to us and said, we want you to create a Christmas gift for all our corporate clients. And this is going around Australia. We had to source the wine, design the labels, and design the packaging. And again, this is proprietary. Um, this is that whole box is made out of one piece of single face. It's one piece of e fluid. Um, it took me two goes to design it and make it work. Using repetitive engineers again, same with that. And I used rubber O rings, like, you know, get into industrial stuff, go and find out what you can use and marry them together. Wax seal, of course, not a big deal. And it's called touch and taste, hence the little, on here is a little hand, there's a little mouth, and, you know. And that's what it's like when it opens. Um, Works out beautifully, actually. Just the detail um, shows you how it looks. Uh, then we get into whiskies. Um, this is the first of two whiskies we've done. Um, this one's Selden's Cove, which I don't know if you're into whiskey, but Selden's Cove whiskey has been rated as the top whiskey in the world, which is great for them. So real. So this packaging we did I don't know, eight years, seven, seven, eight years ago. And you know, we've got, there are three in the range, and starting price, 100 bucks. This one here, 300 bucks, I think. We won the West End. Um, uh, Dennis Collins uh, owns this, well, oh, his family. And when they came to us, they said, oh, we want to, we want you to create a brand, but we also want a whole look and feel. And I don't know if you know what LVL lumber is or timber. It's when they take, you know, they laminate it, it's all in strips. And, you know, it could be 14 metres long, this stuff. It's super, super strong. So I came up with this idea and I thought, well, hold on. We've got a photograph. They have all these different types, they have different brand names for them. And in the end, I thought, the best way to handle this job is if we actually build a mini house and build it in a studio. And then we can get people to be photographing stuff in that environment. It could be raining, hailing, it could be 100 degrees outside, it doesn't matter. It, there was a two week photo shoot on this because we occupied all of Gale Force, um, Richard Gale's studio when he was working over there. I, was, I, was, I had to drive my wife to work when we were starting this job. And I was driving and, and I was thinking, oh, this is all about what, you know. It's all about better wood. And I went, hold on, this is all about building better wood. So I wrote that down. And when the client came in, I had this little strap line there. And he looks at me and goes, oh, that's good. I go, yeah, you like that, do you? And he said, yeah. And he looked at me and goes, he said, you're not going to give that to me, are you? I said, no, we're going to negotiate the fee. He said, you don't have to have it. But of course he did. And all of this, you know, engineer to load, engineer to land, engineer to last, end story. So there was a lot of logic to it. Shows you all the applications as best we can. Such. Then that we got uh, Burswood. Um, Burswood came to us and they said we'd like you to design the brand for what's the build. It's the high end game. It's all changed recently because of Crown uh, took it, they rebranded it Crown. I just stuck this one in here because I really like this. 
That's the city, that's the mark. But the guy that made this was a biker. And they cut them all out, and this biker, you know, they, they worked on motorbikes and polished things, and he shaped all that thing. And it's just fitted beautifully to the to this timber work. We also had the brand Allure when it was around, and that's all changed. And this is my Miss Allure. And this, this woman was a real treat to work with. She's not really a model, she's an, she's an actress. Um, and she came up beautifully. The client, I think they were on drugs, I think, at the time, because the client said to me, she said, oh, can we do something like have a crab in there? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said, crab in there, for God's sake. So, they, came, they said, oh, we can give you the crab. So you go down, I ended up with this crab, it was about that thing. I thought, what am I going to do? So I had to source a taxidermist. The taxidermist, and we had all these little crabs as well, we worked on those, and then we had to take all the crabs over to Plum Design, I think it is, the, that stage crab, and they painted up the crab, and the crab's there. <laughs> and my wife's a teacher. And she said, you can't throw that out. So we have the crab at home in our loft. And it goes off to school every couple of years for the kids to try and draw crabs. And <laughs> One thing I wanted to do, and the client actually went for it in the end, I call this my mother D2. And I wanted, you know, I wanted to have the, the, this model in a, in a look that was kind of feisty, but it was from another time in this contemporary environment. The beauty was with this, we had to take this lovely um, actress model and we had to have a whole outfit made, the shirt, the waistcoat, the trousers, everything. And she looked really, really good. And there it is, this full outfit. Predable was the first in a series of wine lovers with Sandford. We redone all the Sandford range. This is that iron one, and it's just an example of beautiful typography. Um, trying to use the whole labor space in a different way. Then it continued to the white range, I think they called it, and the state reserve range. Um, and we also had to re redo their brand market, like the house market. Case Couture is for this absolutely lovely young lady. She came to me about four years ago. And she was uh, one of these ladies that you know, would dance on you know, all the ships that go around about that, that, that. And she said to me, she said, I've got a real issue. And she said, I want you to design my brand. I said, okay. And she said, it's for a makeup case. And she said, because what happened? And she said, she said, I know what it's like to try and put makeup on. I couldn't really relate to this because I didn't need makeup. Anyway, she said, I really want something that's, and she liked the look, obviously that's why she came to us. But we had to design it so it would, could be really, really seriously embossed into the aluminium cases that you put all the makeup in and have all the LED lights. And it's that, again, that juxtaposition, that kind of audacious Rococo type style and the type here, when I was drawing that up, I just really wanted something that was a bit, you know, like late, 1800s, early 1900s out of France, um, just putting it together. And it works a treat on the cases. This here is, we're in this, it was when it was Polandria and it came to Three Oceans Wine Company. And they came to me and they said, oh, we want you to design, because it was taken over, I must explain, it was taken over by this very sick, really ridiculously rich Chinese gentleman. He's a, Tons of steel work, so it's worth billions of dollars. So he bought Palandry essentially, and they wanted a label that looked French. And they said, Oh, we want a French looking label. And I kind of really didn't like designing something that was you know, a copy of the French. So I came up with this idea of using Sega glass, using bottle printing techniques, of this almost William Morris type pattern printed around the bottle. Now, Obviously, what happens is they have, they have what we call three printing heads. So I actually contacted France and I thought, I don't know if they to do it, because I doodled it. I 
I said, what sort of tolerances do you have? Like how much is, you know, is it gonna move? And they said, half a millimeter max. I went, okay. And I said, what sort of, a, you know, you've got 360 degrees in circle. And I said, what, what, what does each head cover when you print? And they said something like, oh, 160 degrees, say. As soon as they said that, I went, I can do this, I know how to do it. So I designed this so the pattern actually just repeats around. You just have to fiddle with it, get the shape of the bowl. And really, if I can see down there, that total band, there's a little, a little break. And use that numeral number one. Because as they said, I want to call it the chairman. I hated it. But they said, it's really, really important in China. The chairman is very, very important. This sells truckloads at an expensive, you know, it's really expensive going into China um, because it's seen as a really, really precious product and it's very premium. So in the end, it did work very, very well. And it's showing how, you know, sometimes they'll get clients and that you can start to design for the Asian market, they want something Western, but how do you do it? How do you temper it so it appeals to everybody? I stuck this one in, I don't know why, I'll tell you why. I like the name. This crowd came to me and they said, oh, we want you to design a, a brand. We, we you know, supply all these rubber tracks. These things weigh a ton. So I went down with Richard Gale and photographed them, just about broke my back pulling these things around them in the middle of the night. We photographed them now. But they said to me, oh, can you come up with a name? And I said, well, what sort of name do you want? You want something Australian? You want something American? They said, oh, no, more, more European. <coughs> I went, okay, European. So in the end, I was going through all these names, and I went, oh, it's a bit like Bosch, you know? Oh, that's, that's solid. And I went, oh, <coughs> tracks, deck. And I went, D-E-K. Like, -E okay. Spoke to David Stewart at Ray's because I thought, you don't be able to register this name. They can register the name. Fantastic. Obviously, it looks like tracks, tracks. And I went, oh, strap line, on track, on deck. And I went, oh. Yeah, you're all excited, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, The China market again. Fortune Abalone, um, they deal in high-end Abalone. They have a store in Chatswood, in Sydney, that looks like uh, a jewellery store. And this is good for you guys to know. They approached us, never met this client, um, Australian Chinese, I guess. And I said, how did you find us? And they said, we went to the Agda website. We went through the Agda winners. And we looked at all their works. And we liked your work. So then they phoned me. So what I'm going to show you, as I use a guy, I don't know if any of you guys here know Paul Glassell, nice little video, really nice guy. And I've had a bit of a relationship with Paul. And when you're designing proprietary packaging with a crowd that are in Sydney, and then I had to get all this stuff produced offshore. So these are the concepts that I put together. So I draw everything up, detail it, detail it all up, and I Paul would model it for me. So that was concept one, concept two, concept three. And that's the finished packaging. And the beauty was, because all of this was um, manufactured up in China, and I picked stocks that I wanted, like cottage styles, you know, stuff with a lot of rag. I wanted thick wool stuff, and I'd gone through a lot with this in terms of working out how I wanted it. So I detailed everything, um, <coughs> sent it up to them, Two weeks later, two samples came down. Looked at them, went, this is just a little bit too tight. Another week, another full line sample. It's just amazing. I mean, we just we cannot get anything like this produced in Australia because first off, the cost, and second, um, the time. Carried through to carry bag packaging, which they do, and labels. The only thing here on cans was the fact that labels were printed in Sydney. Mandu Estate, another example of some more recent wine stuff that we've been doing, behind reserve range. Mandu deals with the first meeting of Aboriginal and white people. <coughs> and a Malcolm Lindsay 
illustration, of course. He's really good now. Another one for the Asian market. Uh, this company, a couple of Japanese directors, and an Australian one. And I hate the name again. But this is honey, and it's uh, it's um, it's premium honey, which you can only get biannually. Um, it sells for a fortune up in China. And I said, why are you calling it many Jara? And they said, because it's medicinal. They said, in, sorry, in, not China, Japan. And they said, in Japan, people will have a teaspoon of high-grade honey each day because they see it as a really, really good health thing. So this packaging, we had to, in the end, I thought, well, it's a bee. Okay, it's from, you know, let's, if you're going to design a bee, let's have something calligraphic and quite beautiful. Um, Mandy Jarrah, they can pronounce it. So that was the, that job. Uh, this is the other whiskey. Did this about three years ago, I guess. Um, this client came to me and said, really interested in you designing whiskey. And I'm right. Um, and then he said, well, I know the brand will be Old Hobart Distillery. And I said to him, look, I've got a real concern because I the old Hobart Distillery is a destination. It's not a brand. So it took me a long time to wear him down on this. His name is Casey Overing. And I just love that name, Overing. It's actually Dutch. But it just felt right. So I spoke to David Stewart at Braves again. And I said, oh, what's the chances of registering a name? You know, like a, a, a person's name. And he said, keep this in your head. He said, if there are less than 50 overings in the white pages, as in the residential, across Australia, you can register it. I oh, went. And he said, and there are less. So I convinced Casey to use the brand Overing. And he said to me at some stage that he promised himself that he would produce a decent whiskey one day. So I created this little strap line, you know, born of promise. And he, he was unsure about this, but he went for it. He said, oh, the premium ovary. And I actually put the singular ovary. And he looked at me and he went, that means odd, doesn't it? I said, yeah, but it means different too. So he went, I'm going to go for that. The bottle is printed <coughs> with bright, bright gold and creams in France. Capsule in the corporate out of France. Labels are actually printed by super stick labels here. Cass is out of China. Uh, it has been produced by people up there. And the bulk cup is out of novel. So it was more again, once you create a whole book, and there isn't just one label, there are there are six in this series. It was the whole logistics of managing it and dealing with all these people in different countries. Next thing is a bit of frivolous stuff. Uh, um, uh, Ed Stroud, was, uh, he's a lovely designer. He, he came in and was doing a bit of work experience with me. This client had this awful name for a range of Planet aware apparel, and he wanted all the footprints of animals that are endangered on this stuff, and he wanted to, wanted to call it pauses. And I went, pauses. And he went, yeah, you get it, pause. And I was thinking, oh, this is a real worry. I don't know again how I came up with it, but I was thinking, oh, you know, if we're not careful, we'll be the next people that will be extinct. And I went, next. Next thing. Okay, hey, there's a name in this, and it could be registered. The hand? Well, it's kind of saying maybe it will be us next time, and I'm not going to just hold it in the middle of the hand and I'll work that one out. And this is just some of the stuff that we did. Bit of fun, nightmare finding the sizes of all the paw prints and what their stride was of all the various animals. And uh, Enrico helped on this. He came back and did a little bit of work with us. And there it is, just the back of our apparel. Save Glass, who I mentioned to you, uh, they came to me. Um, I worked with Save Glass Australia, and then the Save Glass France, and the French team as well. 
and they said, look, we'd really like an app put together which sort of talks about all the glass that we produce. And I thought, what well, you're known for wine bottles. Um, it, they produce all this other like glass, glass with the spirits, you know, it just goes on, it's huge. So, in the end, I thought, how am I going to handle this? Because I don't really want to focus on wine too much, but I have to. So I went out, a bar of aluminium, a big bar, had a little polish. Rob Simeon took this shot. I went and got a bottle. I went and got one of their plans. Printed it all on, um, on uh, like watercolour paper. Tore it all up, put it all on, and we photographed that. Rob did a lovely job on it. And in the end, just wrote that little line. Some may speak of range, others of quality. Don't speak of sound class. They ended up using that image at the French end as well for promotions as well. So it was nice to hear that. Uh, this was for um, Simo's ice cream. He came along to me about two and a half, three years ago. Said, I want a premium ice cream done for adults. You know, Simo stuff is great. It was a bit of fun. And he had these black cubes that are all out of Italy. So he he had the he wanted to be around cubes. So we ended up with this little cube mark. Um, I had to actually. I had to. Do, I said to him. If you're going to have this big label going around, I said, we've got to make sure it'll work well. So I used these synthetic stocks, made sure that they would work in the freezer and everything would work, and had to design a jig so that they, because you think about it, these labels are 600 mils long. So we designed these jigs with all the labels, even the people who drop the, the you know, the full ice cream containers on them and they just go around, they'd be perfectly square. Because if you haven't got stuff square, it just won't work. So again, you're having to rationalise how a client could potentially do something or apply stuff if you come up with the idea. Logic near the end now, people coming near the end, so hang in there. Um, about two years ago, an old client out of Queensland came to me and he said, um, I've got this uh, application for quality management systems. And he said, um, he's coming. It's called 2020. And he said, I, I, I'd really like you to do work with us again. So I just looked at it and I said, look, one of your first problems is, is you're called 2020, but you're, you're creating a brand and you can't use that on this software application, which is cloud-based. Got all these people in medical centers around Australia using it. In fact, you just sent me an email yesterday because you've got two companies in New Zealand now and they're buying it. So after, it's a real nightmare if you get into brand name development, developing names for tech-related stuff, and it's all sucked up. Came up with this name, uh, Logique, uh, L-O-G-I, you can go Logique or Logique or Logique or QC. I said to him, I don't really care. And out of that, QC, because it's all about quality control, quality control, as they call them, I was sitting there and I moved this thing around, Oh, oh, it looks like So then I started adding more hair and a little speech bubble. And I thought, oh, hold on, there's a family here because I'm trying to think in terms of promotion stuff. So then all these promote, all this stuff started getting used on the web website, like understanding quality management, management you know, and all up to one collective effort to deliver a good hair day. Plant, you know. Doesn't have any hair. Was a bit anxious about using that one, um, but in the end he went, no. He said, my wife likes it. Um, uh, understanding quality management. There's always more than equal order, um, and so you know, walk the same world. Then we had to have this big campaign, and I thought, because he's got all these expos, and they're going out. All these, this guy's coming on the radar. So I developed this Discover QC, and this. Is like bigger than Ben Hur. So when you go to an exposition, instead of having a backdrop of all these little photos, is this big mother. It is huge. And he said it's been working beautifully because it's so simple, because QC is the heart of this program. Just a bit of a look at some of the stuff that the brochures I've had to do. Not over the top. Paul Basson had to build all that stuff for me. And there's the fun bits. Almost there now. One more after this, and I'll get out of here.
I got a call, I had two jobs, I couldn't believe it. You know, you, you have ups and downs as a designer when you're sort of, you know, working by yourself. And at Christmas time, I get this call from this old steamer, from this woman. And she said, oh, she said, I need packaging done because what I've got really sucks, S-U-S. <laughs> you know, I've got cat decorating jars and I thought, I was just about to go delete. And I'm going, no, don't do that. Always, always be nice to people because they might bad mouth So I phoned her up. And I said, look, I don't know if I'm going to die you. You probably need to get something else. She said, oh, I really need it to be really quick. She said, because there's a big thing happening with it. It's going to be this big launch. And it's awful. And I said, well, have you, I hate the name. Another name, I hate it. I said, have you registered the name? She said, oh, yeah, yeah, I've done that. With raised. No, 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 okay. So then I said, and she said, oh, and she said, I've got raised. We're applying for patents or patents. And I went, oh. So I thought, hold on. Something's going on here. It's, it, it, you know, they are spending nearly 200 thousand dollars on the patents and I had to get this thing and I said how much time have I got she said I've got to have it by the end of the month I had to get it all printed and I thought can't use my China connection so I used Percival and they did a really good job the interesting thing credit to this little woman who is a cake maker right she's come up with these products everybody's interested in them but she's got Peters talking to her and they saw her in terms of licensing these gels to use on their ice creams. And they're talking a lot of money that they will pay her for the licensing. So, lovely lady. I really, you know, you come and do a job and you go, ah, you know, did I want to do it? But it was a lot of fun. And I learned about cake nozzles. <laughs> <laughs> I stuck this in for a bit of fun. Because what happened was, when she, I said, and it's important as young designers you, you think about this when if you get a job don't it's not just about graphics it's understanding the client and their product i never baked a cake in my life never i don't know how to do it but i said to her look can you tell me how this works so she said oh it's easy you know you do this she said you cut the sachet and you shove it in here and you do this and you're squeegeeing it out and i went well i said how are, you, how are your clients and your customers going to know that? She goes, oh, wouldn't they know that? And I said, I don't think so. So I photographed her, we illustrated it all up, and we put this card in which holds the products inside. Ooh, it's got a, you know, a bag and all the rest of it. And I thought, oh, I know what I'll do. I thought, this is quite a heavy weight. I'll have a lot of score through the middle. So when people go, oh, I've got a squeegee here, I go, oh, wow, this is too much. Fold card and half up in half and use it as a squeegee. As she said to me, she's this big expo in uh, Sydney, and she said, everybody looked at it and went, this is so well thought out. This is really, really great. So if nothing else, she's a lovely lady, and I hope she makes a million out of it. Now, this is my last one. And then all your kids can all go home to death. <laughs> I'm 61. Last year, I, was, I won the job to design the biography for Stan Perrin. Stan Perrin, Perrin grew 90 years old. I was the perfect dude for it because, look, in Stan's eyes, I'm a really young wife. <laughs> what was beautiful doing this job, it's the, it, in one way, it, it wasn't what I expected, and it went for six months because Rob Simeon, really beautiful photographer, so decent sized book. The color, they wanted it leather, leather covered, and I sort of got them away from that. And I sourced this beautiful, quite contemporary color material out of uh, Belgium. And I was able to get that over. These are just some of the shots. But one I want to show you, which is coming up. Stan Perrin owns the whole Toyota franchise. <coughs> Every Toyota that comes into WA gets money for it. QB, uh, sorry, this is Central Park, shopping centres, mining interests. As I said, he's worth about $3 billion. And he's a beautiful old man. Doesn't use a cane, drives a car to work every day. He came in a big bloody Lexus and backed it in himself. Like Ross Hill and I just sort of watched him. 90. 
This is what I wanted to talk about. This image here, what happened with Stan? And it's really interesting. The thing is, get to know your client. A book had been written 25 years before, and this really was his follow-up one. And in the book, there was these dodgy references to fretwork machines. Do you people know what fretworking is? The kids, yes, no? No. You can get fretwork saws, but you can get fretwork machines. It turned out that Stan, when he was about 13 years old, he was you know, obviously reasonably entrepreneurial. He lived up in the gold fields. And he used to get, he used to cut out flower holes and the like and sell them to the miners and the miners' wives. Anyway, I said to him, you know, I'd really love to get some stuff on that fragment machine. And he looked at me and he went, oh, oh, it's downstairs in the storeroom. I went, what? He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, can I? Can I have a look at it? No. It took me four months to break this bloke down. And one day I said to him, look, Stan, I really want to get my hands on this fragment machine. And he said, I won't be able to put it together. I said, trust me, I'll be able to put it together. I got this big box, I took it home. When I opened the box, there was the fragment machine in pieces. Well, even more beautiful than that, there was a whole stack of hobby weekly magazines and the, and the one he, the, the, the actual ad was in one that he actually applied for, he sent the money for. These are all like 1933 magazines. And there were samples of his fretwork, his little flower pot holders, all varnished. It, there was even a huge model of Sydney Harbour Bridge. I couldn't believe it. So I worked all night, put this thing together, and I said to Rob Simeon, you must photograph all this stuff because it was just priceless. But also from a designer's point of view to look at stuff that is a better part of 80 years old in the magazine. <coughs> That's it from me, people. You can all go in now. <laughs>
Um, one thing I've learned over the years is that anything that you design, and you design really, really well, is because you like it. If you try to design because other people are designing that way, it's never going to work. So be true to yourself in that way, and good luck. But in terms of your question on technology, it's going to, I feel sorry for you guys. <laughs> I'm being honest, because my generation had to learn how to use computers, if potentially if they're going to survive. And that's been a bit of a leap. For you guys, well, what's going to come next? I mean, you saw up there 15 years worth of work, you saw that transition in terms of technologies coming in. The, the hardest thing for all of you guys, and you can sort of see it's happening now, is the pie is getting nibbled away by um, people out there. It used to be desktop. You know, every man and his dog now has got um, um, InDesign. Um, how many people do you know that have Photoshop at home? So you start to get to the stage that you've got a lot of people, lay people out there, who think they know how to design. To keep a step ahead of them, you've actually really, not just from a technical, technological point of view, it's a bit like Janice for her work, she keeps looking in terms of what are the influences. Well, the average person out there, out there can only try and emulate that. So it's, it's important to really sort of drive a stake in and be true to it and follow that. I've tried to over the years, you can sort of hopefully see a little bit of a, a continuity in it all, be it the brown period and dated, it doesn't really matter. That's how I think. Thank you for that, it's beautiful. Right. Uh, any other questions before we quickly wrap it up? No, well, that looks like that's, that's it for tonight. Um, I need to thank our two speakers, uh, John, Amazing, amazing body of work. Um, I'm really embarrassed I've got about my folio now. Slides, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm completely embarrassed about my folio now. Um, thank you. And uh, Janice Law as well, who's absolutely amazing. So thanks everyone for coming tonight. I need to say a really big thanks as well to our print sponsor, Anthony from Discus, who unfortunately is here tonight. Um, to all of my fellow Dan community, um, Hayley and Kate, thanks again for helping out tonight, and Bronwyn. Um, and most of all, thank you to everyone here for coming. Thanks for supporting our little industry. That's it. Thank you.